All right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, greetings, good day, happy Sunday, everybody. Um, well, welcome. We have uh, an hour here today to talk about all things exploits, hacks, all the bad things, all of the, the good, bad, and ugly of hacks in the DeFi, crypto, Web3 space. So um, my name is Rob Benke. I am the CEO and co-founder of Halborn. We're a cybersecurity firm focused on all of those things, really, and trying to make the space a little bit more secure. Um, on stage with us, we have a great panel. Uh, quick shout out to uh, the Railgun team for putting this all together, so thank you. And um, the way that I figured, I mean, we have an hour here, right? So let's, I mean, we're going to dig into it. So I figured um, a good way to almost approach this is just let's bitch about the problems. There's going to be a bunch, and then we can dig into solutions. I figured that's probably a good way to just kind of structure a little bit of this. Um, and then, you know, that was the quick little intro on myself. Can we just do a quick, uh, you know, 30-second elevator pitch on uh, who you are and really um, kind of what you're working on in the space as well, just because, uh, you know, so, so, so on my end, I'm, I'm actually the, the, not, the one non-technical on our entire team of 50-plus ethical hackers in the space. Um, so I'm just focused on all things sort of biz dev sales and uh, kind of growing the ecosystem. So how about yourself? Hi there, everyone. I'm Chris Hughes, and I'm the founder of ETH Trust. And ETH Trust is a regulated bank, or actually a trust company. We're, we'll get there. But we're basically building uh, segregated custody, high security wallets, like a real, you know, not your keys, not your crypto, my friends. And I live that way. And I'm trying to give that to my customers. So I'm Chris from ETH Trust. I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm a core developer at Olympus. And if people aren't familiar with Olympus, it aims to be the reserve currency of DeFi. Uh, hi, I'm Omar Goldberg. I'm the founder at Chaos Labs. And Chaos Labs is a cloud platform for running agent and scenario based simulations to test uh, economic robustness of DeFi protocols. I'm Dylan from Railgun Project, uh, one of the core developers. Um, started doing front end development, and now we decided integration engineer is more a uh, better title for me as I kind of help pull everything together in the middle. Also, I should mention that Railgun is a privacy solution uh, for like layer one as well as layer two solutions. All right. So. What are the problems in the space? I mean, really, like, let's talk about wh why the problems even exist. So I think the entire world works off of incentives for the most part. What are the incentives uh, to even hack one of these systems? Free money. Yeah, free money. Like, let's start with all the free money. Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. Like, reason number one. Duh. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's just Chris. pinatas yeah. everywhere. And we're... <laughs> I mean, it's it, like the most fun to go like, oh, wait a minute. Another incentive would be to get a job with you guys. <laughs> right? I mean, true story. Now, look, I, um, I, I'm, I'm a hacker. I can proudly say that. I'm, I'm, even though I'm the chief, uh, well, I'm the chief engineering officer at ETH Trust. So uh, nerds all the way up, turtles all the way down. Like, <laughs> that's just the way it is. And, um, you know, I've lost a lot of money in, in crypto. Uh, Exchange hacks, uh, DeFi rug pulls. Um, like mine is generally the first capital lost, period. Because I don't want investor money lost. That's terrible. So I go like I'm the guy that licks and like is that electric? And you're like, oh yeah, definitely hot, hot, too spicy. Now, um, so as a person who like tries to calculate risk, because that's really all we're doing. Like at the end of the day. Hacking stuff, the other stuff is just risk calculation. How risky do you want to be? Um, we can figure out ways to make this safe and more reasonable. Um, uh, like I think it's important to take an adversarial mind uh, and apply that to traditional finance and look for the holes and say like, where are the things? Because um, you know the Byzantine problem is a fun one, like, and it's a fun one when you take it into a trusted universe. So, anyhow, uh, like, I clearly have strong ideas about this sort of stuff. But I mean, I'm I am a hacker. I'm that that is what I was actually famous for. So, uh, if you guys have an iPhone and the iPhone is not on AT and T, you have me and my fun team to thank for that. Like, we were the early reverse engineers on saying 
hey, let's open things up a little bit, you know? Now, that creates bad incentives because Apple's now paying AT&T for every iPhone shipped, whether or not it joins the network, and they're losing billions of dollars on the other side. So they want out of, like, so it, like the world is built on incentives, and the incentives are, like, changed by, like, weirdo hackers. So, yeah, uh, put your money there, where it needs to be. It's like the, you know, the people that want to see the world burn, too, right? So, of course, there's the financial aspect, and then there's, of course, the just the, the, the grandiosity of it as well. I mean, who is it? Is it Polly? Yeah, Polly, uh, Polly Ch not Polly Chain. Uh, well, no, no, because it was the, it was a Poly Network, right? And so they ended up supposedly giving this gentleman a, uh, you know, a job afterwards. I mean, so. <laughs> so, 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 like, let's think about that. Like, you, you could have pantsed a network for $600 million, okay? Like, um, but we live in the world Well, of, they knew who he was. Well, yes. Yes. That, that doesn't, you know. Drastically different incentives. Well, okay. Okay, fair enough. They knew like, who you were. Okay. Yeah, okay. That, 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 like. <laughs> Going to jail seriously sucks, okay? No one wants that. Like, who here? Who here is like, yeah, orange. Totes. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Um, so, like, so yes. So when you have the identities, when you have skin in the game, when there's risk on the other side, like real risk of loss, loss of freedom, like loss of your ability to enjoy the normal world around you, that will change a human's incentives and make them think slightly differently, right? You know, like... But uh, we don't have that teeth across these DeFi games just yet. Where, like, when I when I when I ape into your LP pool, like, and you give me like magic beans on the literal magic beans, I'm giving you magic beans that are more valuable than the magic beans you're giving me back, yep. based on future magic beans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, so and then, so so we're. When you talk about incentives, it's, it is obviously pretty clear, right? When people were hacking, you know, all the different internet protocols in the '90s, I mean, it wasn't technically a form of money, right? And now, now you have money that you can hack into internet money, right? So the incentives are pretty clear. Why you would want to go either good cop, bad cop, or somewhere in the middle, right? So if you want to rob a bank, um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So how are people robbing banks right now? Well, you know, I, I would imagine this whole group, everyone listening out there, um, you're either one of those uh, those people aping in to the systems or you're, you know, a developer or, or any of the above. So there's a lot of tools out there. Um, flash loans are a big one, for example. Why don't we dig into flash loans? Um, does anyone have any? Yeah. I mean, so, right, we're talking about hacking, right? Right. And I mean, is it really a hack? In right. the in the yeah. sense that a hack is a clever thing to do, sure. But it's not, I mean, it's allowed technically, like if you're playing within the rules. So that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we see flash loans and, you know, essentially that's just the way to people associate, you know, there's months ago where you could, you know, couldn't go one week without hearing about some flash loan for tens of millions of dollars. And I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it, it might be billions of dollars of funds, hundreds of millions of dollars of funds that they're borrowing in the single block. But, you know, a wow could always just do that at the end of the day, you know, and just, yeah. you know, without lending. So is, 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 is it that? I mean, at the end of the day, it really is pretty much a arbitrage opportunity that people are capitalizing on. And, you know, it might be a vulnerability in the contract and, you know, how the pool works. But, I mean, morally, it, it's wrong. But, you know, Legally, again, I mean, it's it's one of those things, you know, I like to hear people think, you know, legally, you know, doing some sort of re-entrancy or, or if, you know, you know, flash loan um, arbitrage of that large, uh, what, what the panel will think about that. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in particular, uh, but I do have to say that if you are seeing re-entrancy attacks at this day and age, like, you, you really are, like, um, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so look, like, like, our, like our firm does do smart contract audits, but we are end to end security. There is way more naughty business that can happen besides smart contract audits. So, if you didn't get a smart contract audit, just to even check on those that basic level of are there potential reentrancy attacks? Okay, um, but like, all right, because apparently I'm... someone mentioned Grim right before we stopped, yeah. you know, stepped on here. There was an incident very recently. I think but yesterday, like right? Cloud flare workers. That's a different story. We're All gonna right. get to that. I love All that right. you bring this like up. We're gonna get to cloud flare. Flare workers. 
pwned yeah. us. Like yeah. the centrality <laughs> fucked us again. Is that what you're saying? Like, yes. yeah, yeah, that's what we're saying. Yes. With the decentral toys that we've like, we come over here, we put a nice little space over here where all of us are like being kind and good with our money and different. And then, so, yeah. So there's lots of, uh, I'm really curious about uh, what you're up to with Chaos Labs and, you know, taking the adversarial sort of approach. So there are a lot of different ways that you can approach robbing a theoretical bank. So what, what are you guys up to and how, how do you think about the problem? Um, so first of all, like uh, kind of to play off of the first question about like why it's happening and why it's so prevalent, uh, there's a lot of money, um, which makes it like a really nice target for anybody who's trying to kind of evaluate impact and where they should be focusing on. And then the other end of that is that it's new technology, it's new paradigms, distributed smart contracts. Um, so a lot of developers aren't really well versed and don't know what they're doing. And it's much worse since when you push, it's there forever. Uh, so if you're coming from web two, uh, you iterate fast and you wanna ship projects and if there's a bug or something's wrong, you just deploy again and within three or four hours, it's fine. Uh, but here that isn't the case. Um, so that's why it's happening so much. And then kind of to connect it to the second question about flash loans. Um, so we said new technologies and new primitives and new ways of thinking. One of them are our flash loans. Developers don't, not everybody, like being able to like implement one or make it like supported in your protocol doesn't mean that you understand it or, or like, like everything that comes along with it. Um, and then specifically in DeFi, it's a little bit more complicated because you have a lot of composability, uh, which is great for kind of like building new tools and applications quickly, but it also introduces like a lot of dependencies uh, into your applications, which are attack vectors in themselves. Um, so maybe you support like, Maybe you, in a non-direct way, you have support for like flash loans or your application can be affected by it. And most application developers don't even consider that as a dependency in their app. Um, so that opens up a lot of doors for people who are well-versed. Um, and I think for us, the way that we're approaching it is we want to give all the developers like the best tools, kind of the same standards of tools that they'd be using in Web 2, in Web 3. Because right now, um, you could use like like amazing audit firms like Halburn and, and, you know, Trail of Bits and the Open Zeppelins of the world. But um, it's most developers aren't going to like build bulletproof applications without those tools. And that's what you see in Web 2. So that's what we're trying to do. So, yeah, one thing on this is just like, you know, a lot of the hacks with flash loans are kind of like a new reentrancy problem, right? <laughs> like, so you're, you've got these protocols, these money Legos, but you've, Put them, you know, build, put them together in such a way that allows you to, you know, repeatedly loan here and then, you know, go over there, cash it out, reloan, and do that 10, 20 times, whatever, and then you have all the money. Uh, every once in a while, I like to just look up, dig up little pieces of data. I, I mean, so the 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 easy stuff that I've seen recently is uh, what is it? Chain analysis is saying that three billion was lost to rug pulls this year. Uh, Elliptic said 10 billion in just overall DeFi. Uh, to this particular topic that you were just talking about, um, the stat that I heard, now I have no idea how they measure this, but there is a stat out there that for every 13 lines of code, a developer has written a bug. All right. Okay, so, so I, I'm a Solidity dev, <laughs> and okay, my, so my numbers yeah. are worse than that, yeah. sir. All right, yeah, I'll yeah. be the first to admit yeah. it. Okay, this is why we have extra eyes, because <clears throat> Are you kidding? Yeah. Like, I'm sitting yep. here just trying to design it optimistically. Like, come on now. And someone's like, I'd like to see you naked. Yeah. yeah. Always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a terrible way to write your life. Stop yeah. and think about that. You sit down and you're like, well, um, everyone hates me. <laughs> like everyone. <laughs> like all of them. And my job is to like keep the little pile of nuts from getting raided. And then, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then yeah. some DeFi fuck creates flash loans, and then you're like, I didn't even plan for that. Yep, yep. yep. Okay, like, are you kidding? I was sitting here just trying to do my money Legos, and someone goes like, Have you seen a Duplo, bro? Because I got some. And you're yeah. like, How? Immediately with a flash borrow through this like liquid, and you're like, That's magic. Okay, and the market gets that much more efficient that quickly. Yep. Now. Tell you a fun story about a okay. Who here's lost money in crypto? I want to see a raise of hands. Like, 
I mean, not just by holding it. <laughs> I mean, like, literally just actually lost it because of something stupid. All right? All right. It's it, like, it sucks, right? Like, losing money sucks. It's like 100, like, it's like being too drunk and dropping the 20 or, like, it's terrible. But, like, but, like, seriously doing it, you know? Uh, but also doing it and not expecting it to happen. See, this is the other fucked part. Because some of us have lost money on exchanges. Some of us have lost money on rug pulls. Some of us have lost money on bad devs. Some, like, just, like, y yes. Some of us, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Some of us, all of us. Anyway. But in that, um, the process is making the machine, like, it's weird to say this. The sacrifice is making the machine better. Like, it's weird because, like, we're all learning stuff. Well, it's all and, open source. It's all and, out there. And we're all right? going like, so oh, wow, that's a really cool way to get pantsed. Uh, let's not get pants like that again. Let's <laughs> lock those up like that. All right. That's nice. Um, so, you know, innovation is breaking things. Like, really. And sometimes it's like being on the bad side of a trade. Like, people on Wall Street don't give, like, if you're on the bad side of Wall Street, you know, it's like, sorry. Like, we'll drink together. But... There's someone winning and someone losing, and that has to happen. Yep. You know, let's not forget that we're in a two-sided market. We're in finance. Well, and to, forget that. And to that point, so you know, again, talking about sort of the problems that are existing out there. So most people, um, so I, I couldn't agree more with your assessment of you have proper Web two devs, you know, proper devs out there, and the philosophy is to build and ship fast. Get the MVP done in four weeks time and eight weeks time. And then a web three person's like, great. I just made this great MVP. Let me go talk to a smart contract auditing firm. Oh, you can't start until June. Shit. You know, so there is an inherent sort of supply and demand issue for sure. So, well, we're not going to dig into solutions just yet. There are definitely different things to do here. Uh, <laughs> I will say that, uh, you you brought up recently too this Cloudflare issue, right? So uh, one of the more recent issues is that, of course, you have uh, you know people throwing a ton of money into like awesome projects like BadgerDAO. We love BadgerDAO, and uh, then it's not even a smart contract issue. It's the fact that you know a messed up credential, like the skip loader, the thing that you load into it. Like mm -hmm. okay, yeah. so um, you want to explain the specifics? Okay, as so we'll, to what we'll go into the mechanics know? of the hack of how the hack happened. Okay, because <laughs> because money was lost from human beings in a moderately kind of clever way. Very clever. Very yeah. clever. Yeah. We'll we'll yeah. just sit here and go like yeah. that. Nerd is fifty million dollars richer. One hundred and twenty. Oh, oh, geez, killing it, bro. Or gal, or however you choose to identify. Potentially nation state. Um, <laughs> like shit, nope. I'll, I'll go there. No, I like, will. Really, I will. Like, like I'll hands down go there for sure. Yeah. Come on now, then money's big enough that it fucking matters. All right, like that's enough to go steal for sure. Um, I'll tell you the last time I got robbed, crypto. But but I'll go. Let, let's talk about this cloud fair worker problem here for a second. All right. Uh, so. All right, uh, we live in kind of decentralized infrastructure. The smart contracts are living on virtual machines that are distributed on all kinds of other computers. Um, you guys have your wallets, your MetaMasks, your things on your side. That's also very well decentralized. That's good. Yay, yay. So far, we're doing all right. Now, the interfaces, the tools that people use to interact with those things, like the, the, the stuff, you know. Can you believe we have not cryptographically signed the, like, the deposit into a contract yet like we've not as crypto humans gone that meta to say you know what we should do like ensure that it's going into the correct place exactly where we expect it to mm -hmm. like can you imagine that like this is how not we've thought of this yet and i'm one of the developers making the shit mm -hmm. like real talk mm -hmm. i'm like wow that's probably a good idea like people would get less fucked that way Let's like, and, and that's literally what, like, yes, it's a great idea. We should figure out how to sign transactions into expected contracts so that, th like, this is an idea, you know, for us to sit down and use cryptography, go meta with it, because that's what we're doing, like, properly, I would hope. But okay, so what ends up happening so, here? Some so clever so back, so nation down. state. So back to Badger down. Okay. So, or maybe maybe some clever nation statement. Well, I didn't say that. A hacking team of elite humans. 
go off and poison a, well, they go apply for developer keys. Okay, this is a weird bug. They apply for developer keys. Like, so there's a failure of OPSEC in here somewhere. Like, how else did they get into the API keys of the BadgerDAO organization? Well, so, so yeah, there was a failure so of OPSEC there, like, period. Some asshole drinking at a bar, like, got pwned by someone else, you know? Like, let's talk about how it could have happened. Well, so possibly. So, um, because we're still talking about problems, right? So Badger that was clearly like at the end of the day, there was a front end issue, but a front end flare. issue with one of the core devs, like like one yeah. of the core devs machines so, got compromised in some sort of way. Requested an API key, handed that API key off to someone else. This shit got exfiltrated somehow. Like first of all, that is like mission impossible shit right there. Like fucking Tom Cruise, like. Or, I'm at a coffee shop. Or, or inside job. Inside job. Or which I'm not stating ooh. whatsoever. But so one of the so one of the things we talk no about. No one wants to say inside job. Yeah, but I will. But I mean that's fine. We ought to, because <laughs> yeah. it's a reasonable thing yeah. to say out loud, right? Because yeah. it's like, come on, let's talk about who's stealing the money. Or is it was a nation state doing an inside job? I, I so, don't know. so because we're focusing on like the inherent problems of the ecosystem right now in hacks, the fact is that from a macro level, um, you know, luckily we've probably worked with over 150 projects from a macro level. Insider threats are always going to be one of the biggest issue in the entire industry. So just like, uh, um, it's just a, it's just an observation, especially when you talk with non-technical teams that are outsourcing development, especially, uh, we, we see it time and time again, Badger Dad was not the first one to be, uh, hit with a front end issue. One of my favorite, now this is completely ancillary. This is like completely open and public on Twitter, which is hilarious that you get this information from crypto Twitter. Um, Sushi had an issue a couple months back where where one of their front end developers threw something malicious into a MISO contract. They end up withdrawing and taking all the money out of an NFT launch that happened. Again, come to find out that they actually know who the guy is. They know who this Anon developer is. And the story goes that the three or four sushi devs at that time actually uh, ordered ordered no, they didn't cover it. They ordered seamless and ordered miso soup to the guy's house. And ask for the money back. This is completely public knowledge that's out there on crypto Twitter. Look at look at Joe's uh, thing, and uh, lo and behold, the 500 ETH that was stolen was automatically sent back. Very strange, right? So there's some clear problems here. I think it's about time we start talking about also solutions because there's a couple things that we all can do. Um, what's that? Hey, I'm down for a question. Sure. Yeah. So the, um, the question, <laughs> more of a philosophical statement almost too, being code is law, or is it? And what does that mean when you, yeah, I mean, this is really a philosophical question that everyone has opinions to. Um, if code is law, you have DeFi Lego blocks like uh, flash loans that you could use on particular smart contracts. You know, there was an issue, um, you know, with, with, uh, a project called Mono X recently, where someone used a flash loan, you know, attack, or just they just used the flash loan to do precisely what the code was said to do, and yeah, they were able to withdraw thirty million dollars worth of value. And so, is code law? Well, to the guy who just used that code, probably is law to him. Um, to the people that just had all their money taken out of it, you know. That's when that's when it starts to get dicey. Devs do something. Devs do something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's your opinion on this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that also. Yeah. Do something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that also comes to one one of the headlines of you know defined exploits. Who's responsible? 
you know, right. because I'll come, I'll go back to the Grimm, the auditing firm, you know, it said there is reentrancy like that, that has been covered. So the fact yep. that it actually wasn't covered is like, well, you know, you said it was covered. And at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it, it comes down to the devs. I mean, no matter how much you, you know, you review code, how many audits you get, you know, the fact that it is immutable, you know, that it's not going to, ch- that you can't change it once it's out there. I mean, should at least give people a lot of hesitation before they actually do a code freeze. But um, so that code is law. I mean, it's very, you know, controversial, you know, there, you know, I think people, you know, devs alike have, you know, their own opinions. I mean, I, I personally think, um, you know, it's, it's open source like that. Um, it's out there. You know, they're using the code as it was written. Um, I mean, exploit, not necessarily a hack. I mean, like I said, it's like what I said earlier, you know, morally it's wrong. Legally is a completely different story. Yeah. I will say one very particular problem that also, you know, great question, by the way. Um, let's talk about a problem that not many people in my seat are usually going to talk about. Uh, smart contract audits in general are public. So in the general sort of red team offensive security, cybersecurity world, penetration test reports never see the light of day. They ne- if, if you're doing, a, you, know, we, you know, we work with major financial institutions you know, all of those penetration test reports, they don't go anywhere. But meanwhile, it is a feature, not a bug, to release a smart contract audit report. Now, if I were a bad guy, one of the first things I would do is it's go look a map. at it is a it's map. It's a really good map. Yep. Yep. Like, do you know like because people are like, have you looked at this? Yep. This is the place where you should look deeper. And so, you're like, okay, maybe that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I mean, look, because I people got, I, usually have an audit and they think that that is, of course, safe. So, but just so like you're saying, I, I've been, it is a I've roadmap. Been, I've been pantsed by my own smart contract. OK, I'll tell you a fun story. All right. So I, I've gotten pants. It happens to the best of us. So uh, uh, I'm in Mexico and uh, I'm, I'm there for my anniversary. It's a really nice day I'm in Mexico. I'm staying at this nice little snazzy place. This guy walks up. He's got a Binance hat. You don't see a lot of Binance hats in this universe, but like this guy, he's tall as fuck. He's got a Binance hat. All right. Mildly curious. Hey, buddy. So take it you're in the cryptos. He's like, oh, yeah. It's like, I am fucking raiding liquidity positions on Binance Smart Chain right now. I wait a minute. I, I said to myself, I just had my liquidity position raided on Binance. Like, is this the guy that just fucking pants me for 40 grand? <laughs> and sure as shit and right as rain, he was. I shit you not. He's like, I'm like, all right, how did you do it? Was it like mempool? He's like, oh, nah, fuck. I, sh- I got Filipino people looking at the publishing on the et. Like, I kid you not, this guy's paying humans to read blockchain scout explorers to go out and personally find the arbitrage. Like on mispriced liquidity pools. Yep. And he completely rugs me like a beast. Like I'm talking like all my money's gone. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to buy you a drink. Because I'm a nice guy. I really should have bought you a drink. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> like I didn't let him know that he rugged me like oh, that. Because okay. like, yeah. come on now. That would be like, I, I, I don't lose that kind of face. Uh-uh. <laughs> Just, just like I just, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna sit here and listen to you, and then figure out how you did it, because I did the counter opsec on the other side. I wanted to figure out like how I got pantsed, like no shit. In this version of the game, you you will literally pay the privilege, including the money lost, to go figure out how you lost the money. Like I will, I'm that person, so as to prevent. And now I'm like, oh wow, because he completely sandwiched me, so, like in such. Oh yeah, it was good, like. Nicely done is what I'm saying. So, like, putting your money at risk is literally putting your money at risk. And uh, this is how the markets get more efficient. So, so how are people supposed to operate in this whole space knowing that you got a bunch of guys out there just trying to do bad stuff there? So, let's talk about solutions. As a developer, what are your thoughts? How are you actually addressing this? Because I've actually, you know, I've heard about Olympus, so I hear it's pretty popular out there. So, how what are you guys doing? <laughs> well, you know, always, <laughs> always a lot of eyes looking at code. Yes. I mean, constantly, you know, really smart people 
always looking at code, always, you know, unit tests, integration tests, you know, always sending anything off for, for an audit, um, you know, and just always polishing, always looking to polish. I mean, we, we just, you know, deployed, I mean, we just did the V2 migration and that was something that, you know, code itself, you know, the core logic may have been done for the last two months, but, you know, it's something that, um, you know, you just keep on looking and looking at and just keep on polishing and polishing. Are you guys considering doing a verification at all? Or I'm sorry, I've just asked, it, it, is, uh, are you exploring formal verification at all? Are you looking at like, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of curious as to what the internal potentially adversarial like computer science might be going on. I'm just I, like for a de like a, a, a pile of like bags like that. I, I have to wonder, you guys are like looking at all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, is it code review? Is it uh, like, are you guys like playing with things on the EVM side? I'm just, yeah, I'm just curious, actually. A lot of code review, a lot of code review, a lot of just playing around um, and, and just seeing, you know, that what we're all trying to do, you know, trying to break stuff, you know, seeing if something breaks and, you know, breaking that obviously before deploying and just, you know, having the best eyes look at the code before it goes live. And, um, I mean, it's something that's worked out so far. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for us, like we work with a lot of teams, and first of all, like security is, is tough just because of how asymmetric it is. You can have like a bunch of smart people looking at stuff; they catch ninety nine percent, and you're gonna get rugged from the one percent. Um, so the more, uh, the better. Um, but I also think that the kind of to what you were saying earlier about like kind of the pressure to ship or to iterate and do an MVP. That mindset kind of needs to change just because of the Agreed. the price of deploying, right? Um, that's number one. And number two, it's like audits are, are really good, but also the developers need to kind of prioritize more the security of, of what they're building. So previous to, to Chaos Labs, the past like four or five years, I was at Facebook and, and Instagram, and we were building apps that also were like on lucrative surfaces. And like, granted, we could like push hot fixes, so it wasn't as bad. Um, but there was no like if I if someone someone on my team came to me and like asked for someone external to kind of like do an audit and and they were finding like super critical bugs for stuff that they were architecting for like months that would be that would be an issue right like so I, I think we're not there yet in crypto uh, just because it's so new and so many of the developers don't have that experience but I think moving forward that's something that like we can look forward to where developers know better like how to test their applications and have the use cases in mind before before they even get started about where to get caught up. Yeah. Uh, there are many blockchains out there now. I will say that it is a good trend that things are moving towards Rust. There are a lot of security uh, rationales as to why you do. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Solana doesn't have a multi-sig. Well, that's a different story. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But well, there's come the f like we're talking about security on a panel right now, mm -hmm. and a top five coin doesn't have multi signature. Well, these are all new. These are all very new still. Still, I mean, I get it, but yeah. like we're not, we're not talking about unsolved problems here. We're talking well, about solved problems that are well solved and even have gotten pantsed on. Well, like, they're waiting for the ecosystem to build for itself. I mean, but see, this <laughs> is like I like look. I, this is uh, where. Alex and I deeply agree. Like we're sitting here like vampiring each other where we should be like trying to just capture more human beings into the space. Look, uh, like security is hard and uh, that much I do know. And I'm not like pitching one bags over another, but I'm like, the, that's the point. Security is incredibly hard. Uh, and the humans that are clever enough to be able to write the multi-sig, um, yeah, well, they haven't stepped in yet or, or they are stepping in now. And yeah. This is just like think about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, so so first of all, I will say that while we're excited about Rust development happening, there is also this concept that is uh, security through obscurity. Okay, so because Solana is very new, uh, Terra is very new, you know, Cosmosm, it's all it's all very new. Um, you know, there haven't been any massive impacting incidences yet so you know it just needs to um i will say that i am excited about a couple different solutions out there so first of all um what can everyone do uh, as a consumer or a business or as a as an org a lot of different things out there 
I will say that is definitely the first thing that I actually talk about is something you just brought up, which is changing that mentality and really trying to think out. It is shocking, but not how many kind of like cold emails that our firm will get for people that need audits yesterday because like, hey, uh, the platform's ready and now we just need an audit. So now we're just talking to you. Uh, foresight and planning ahead is necessary. But when the financial incentives to launch it tomorrow are, exist, that's when it's going to continue to be out of whack. So you will always have your own personal level of risk aping into a brand new system, right? So one of the things that isn't security related that I actually quite like, however, massive amount of caveats are insurance protocols. So I do drastically appreciate the Nexus Mutuals of the world. We're going to get to you in a second, buddy. Uh, Nexus Mutuals of the world. Uh, uh, I'm a advisor of a project called Fairside, which is going to provide comprehensive coverage for all things sort of in the ecosystem. Um, I mean, wh what do we think about insurance protocols in general in, you know, as a solution in general? Uh, have, you, have you guys messed with, around with them? Um, yeah, Olympus actually has, you know, was reaching out um so sort of have talked to some people about that um and it's funny because you know these insurance protocols the ones who are going to be paying out if something happens probably have more incentive to make sure that the code is well written and no bugs than the actual auditing firm may have which you know which is really interesting because you know they'll be the ones who are paying it out so that's <laughs> that's something that's also pretty funny yeah i mean there's there's all sorts of people who uh want these things to remain safe, right? All the stakeholders, I mean, obviously. like, think about this. Yeah. Taking a small percentage of the yield and redirecting it uh, into covers, like, right? Like, this is a, like, reasonable behavior. Like, it's actually not too bad. Massive shout-outs. Uh, like, I don't know if you guys have heard of Atomica, but there's there's there are other humans that are getting into the space that are thinking about it very cleverly. And um, coverage, we're, we're in the space where, like, Finance is evolving, so we have the asset first. We now have the lend. We're now getting to the insurance. You know, like that's like a normal ecosystem boots up and goes live. This is the gestational, you know, steps that it goes through. And so, insurance is the next really big, exciting space in this space. I, I believe in intelligent coverage and protocol coverage. Uh, it's really brilliant, good stuff. Um, yeah, and this is outside of even the smart contract risk. We're not talking about so much about that. Let's just assume everyone's going to be good actors and we can assure that people aren't going to welch on a bet. You know, moving that aside, you're like, okay, the uh, what hap what happens when the technology you know, what happens when things go like nightmare fuel? And this is a reasonable way to to address that, I think. Um a question more for you. So I completely like like understand and agree why like any auditing firm wouldn't want to take like wouldn't want to like pay out in the terms of like a hack just because of the things that we said before like it's so asymmetric right like you, and all some of the stuff is like not like in your control and it was like really interesting to see the recent compound proposal uh where like, i think it was trail of bits open zeppelin and another one i forgot but it was one of the things that came up where it was like uh, four for basically like a retainer and like looking at all of the like proposals that were coming up and another four if there were no major hacks and kind of like within the thread people were talking about that. Um, so like as as someone who's building the systems, I completely like understand why it would be like really like risky and difficult to kind of take responsibility for those things and commit to paying them out. Um, but it also kind of connects like to the insurance protocols um that like agreed to kind of like cover those cases and just interested how you guys think about that because you guys see so much and you are in the position to kind of like underwrite risk and like understand um like yeah how do you think about that in the space sure. um <laughs> there are a lot of different stakeholders out there um so here's the thing so first of all um we are not we do smart contract audits yes we are more sort of end-to-end -end security advisors. So we're really looking at things like aggressive penetration testing of all the major assets that either layer one's coming out with. I mean, we're, we advise, uh, you know, Terra, Thorchain, Avalanche, just on their layer one infrastructure, like node operations, which is very different than like a DeFi Lego block launching and doing things like that as well. Um, here's the thing. When, when we're auditing, we <clears throat> it's important that you remain 
a third party outside of this. Because so one of the things I'm asked all the time is, okay, once you find fixes, can you help us code it? And that's where it starts getting really tricky. So the answer is hard no, um, because if the people who are writing the code are also auditing the code, incentives, again, really bad incentive plays right there, really bad gamification at that point. Um, so the way that we think about it is we're going to assess it. You're, you're going to look at an audit report. So as you look at major findings, that blueprint that uh, the bad guys love so much, uh, on a Halborn, on the Hal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. What you're going to notice on every report, at least from Halborn's side and, and most of the major good good guys out there is like, you're going to see a lot of things saying risk accepted. So what that means is, hey, we found this. And then the core devs um, might disagree with our architecture decision. It's not our call. I'm like, hey, we found this. If you architect it a little bit differently this way, it's going to protect against that. And then that becomes their decision to do that or not. And so that's just by that alone, um, you know, look, I'll, I'll be straightforward. Um, we've been we've been doing this for like two, three years now in the space. I think we have a great reputation, and we used to say that we never were on the wrecked list, and then it recently happened. Oh, and stop it really it. and and look, literally on the auto report, it says risk accepted. No, this shit. is this like, is the thing that we found on the report. Hey, wow. world. This was found. And so it's because of this that we take this exact approach just to answer your question. Like um, in my line, of, in our line of work as like smart contract auditors and so on, it is so much, so much more important that we're saying no to most things. It's like, here's what we're saying yes to. It's this, this scope and we're saying no to the rest so that it allows that sort of um, that misc, that, that risk migration to kind of happen. So I hope that addresses some of that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. the last uh, smart contract, uh, like fun recognition I'd gotten uh, before before the last one, because uh, there's plenty of them. Um, an audit team. Uh, so the nice humans at Cello. I trade on Cello. Uh, I was one of their accelerated companies. So like total disclosure. Um, I didn't take any money from them, but total disclosure. Uh, Nevertheless, believe in the uh, believe in the chain. Bought bought some of the bags, like literally just holding holding it like a like a normal ape. Um, so they're going to build some really awesome cross chain liquidity bridge between the the EVMs. So it's like, okay, that's great. And they get some really cool heavies involved in the project, like Ethereum heavies that I know and respect. So I'm like, oh, this is all even better. Like this is looking good. A, uh, the audit comes back on the bridge code. And, and one of the things that was uh, addressed in the in the audit was uh, uh, some timer for uh, like the bridge could be put into recovery mode if something bad was discovered so as to then in turn like uh, exit the money from the bridge contract. You know, anyway. So that was in the audit. They agreed to fix it. But that isn't what got deployed. Like that's not the story we're in. Okay, well, it gets messier because it becomes a Twitter drama in and of itself, of which I take no sides and don't really care to even get into it. But nevertheless, the bridge got put into recovery mode by some key. And now all of the money is technically at risk because so someone can just go ahead and rate it whenever they want, whoever turned it on. Now, I personally have bags, personally have bags, company has bags. Like, so we're like, shit, de-risk, de-risk. Like, that's like red bells in our place. Um, move all the money across. Now, what's really interesting in this space is like, I audited that code personally, okay? Like, I'm good at this. And um, what ended up happening was one, it got deployed with a EOA, an externally owned account. Like, not a multi-sig did not control the bridge. That's what happened. Ish, ish. It's like literal the most fucking nightmare fuel it gets. Ish. You don't. Yeah. You know, there's very few ways to like bone that one up that good. Um, and like so we were all wrecked technically from the start. Like that's what that was. So 
I mean, even those of us who like approve procedure, look at launch scripts, look at build scripts, work with the co core protocol, know the core engineers, know the thing, like one of the deployment steps gets missed somewhere in the process. And then still the risk is there. And so even amongst the triumvirate or group of them, like some of the very best in this game, um, like boom, like could be boom, but like fortunately no boom, but like, because these are reasonable people, yeah. like that's it. So, um, so let's talk about things that the audience can do to kind of help out in the situation. Actually, before we get into that, you had a question. You were, you, you were patient. Go ahead, throw it out. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, so how paranoid should someone be? Don't ever put any money into anything that you can't afford to lose, right? So, like, that's how paranoid you should be with any thing in the DeFi space at this point. And that's even like heavily audited aspects of it. Um, great question, by the way. So the question being how paranoid should someone be if they are putting money into these things? And then secondly, uh, how do we think about web front ends uh, going into this space as well? I'm looking at this guy right here. Um, I will say that um, our whole approach at Halborn from day one has been that we are proper penetration testers and we are not smart contract auditors. So like we take a proper end-to-end -end security approach. So things are for, 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 uh, it's, it's a funny saying that we say internally, but like our best days are typically our clients worst days, unfortunately, because like we've been prepping for some of these things to happen. So unfortunately, like we have been, preaching to many of our projects that we advise do front end penetration tests. A lot of those don't have to go public. So one of the things that we do as a firm is as opposed to a smart contract audit that will be public and all the information there, uh, we'll do a basically what we're calling an executive summary of a penetration test. It doesn't give any of the finite details, but it says that it's happened. Um, I would say as a community member, if you like a particular protocol, you should probably hit up Telegram, you know, lobby all the community members and say, hey, outside of that smart contract audit, make sure, you know, like, where is the front end pen test report that we can look at to potentially? That is one potential thing I would suggest. Uh, but, you know, look, I'm the one security auditor on the stage. I'm curious, uh, how does a front end developer approach uh, security practices? Um, so, Railgun, we host our front ends on IPFS and generally try to just not have any attack surface to speak of. Um, Love you know, to hear that. Of That's DAO, so good. That's like appropriately gangster. Speaking of the Badger DAO, like what I took away from that, um, you know, is that our DNS records could conceivably be hacked. It's not like, you know, I have trouble going to sleep over that. But it could happen, you know. Somebody well, has a lot of. I was I was one hacked. of the founders of Full Tilt Poker, so I know what it's like when the domain gets taken from you, right? And that that's just a bind record that some Navy officer gets to put in because they run Ring Zero of DNS, right? So like, on my to do list very soon is write a script that just verifies that the CIDs that we've, you know, put on IPFS match what's in the DNS record. Yeah, I mean, um, and that's the the best you can hope for. But seizure, like from the, I mean, without us just doing right. IP At addresses, least with right? The script, like, you know, we like, oh shit, that's not right. We can let the community, everybody know, like, oh shit, don't do anything with this. It's broken. Like, yeah. Okay. Just, just like super interested in like the the patterns and kind of that are emerging here, like in security, because we need new ones, right? Because things are different. So, like in a case like that, like. Are you guys like baking like you know pauses or kill switches into the application in case something like that goes wrong? Because it's one thing to let everybody know like on Twitter, or, like Discord, but not everyone's at the computer and stuff. Like, yeah, well, right. So in that case, um, you know, 
I would presume that the transactions are no longer going to our contract, right? The website has been replaced to use another contract, which is just taking the funds directly, right? Rather than doing something more convoluted with the contract. Sure. Well, so the question is, what do we think about uh, upgradable contracts um, and this idea of hot fixing Web3? Well, um, recently, that one incident that I mentioned, I don't, I don't mind talking about this publicly, sure. You know, it's like the, the, the one incident that happened recently where, you know, we worked so hard to never end up on the right list. We fi it finally happened. And, you know, what these guys did was they decided, oh, we have this upgradable contract. And it's great because... If we see money coming out in a bad manner, we set an alert, and then we're alerted. You know when things are happening. But when it's done in a flash, then it's done in one transaction. So an upgradable smart contract's great and everything, but if it's done in one flash loan, one transaction, you're fucked. So that's you know it's great in the sense that you can upgrade if you see something and it happens. But that is unfortunately this idea of testing in prod. LOL, you know, testing in production, um, it really continues to hurt people and it will only continue to hurt people. Um, I'm curious from a developer standpoint, though, what do you think about these? Well, I would just add that, you know, you're upgrading the contract. Has the new code actually been audited as much as the first one was? Probably not. Like from a marketing perspective, when you're launching, you're like, okay, yeah, we got to have this audit and this audit and that'll give everybody confidence. But once everybody's going and you're looking at an upgrade, um, maybe you've got to upgrade it because you found some other problem. Is the code that you're upgrading with like actually as secure as you think it is, or are you possibly introducing new problems? So I think that's an interesting question for like two parts of it. First of all, like if you're using like proxy patterns and upgradable contracts, then um, you know the whole idea in the beginning was everything would be immutable, right? And you like ape into some like protocol and then the code changes like from under your feet. So it's not always malicious, like as a, in terms of like the developer perspective, like you want to have the flexibility and you want to not have to migrate funds and all that stuff, but there's a delicate balance to strike there. And then from a security perspective, it's it's what was mentioned here that they oftentimes like don't get like the the same type of audits or eyes or people say dangerous things like, oh, it's it's 70 lines of code. What, what did we say, 13? Every 13 lines of code, that's like five bugs. So like the, like, the, like, like there we go. Yeah. It depends, it depends, you know, who's writing it. But like a good example of that is, the, is governance proposals in Compound. I think it was like last month with like the 220 comp that was dripped like to the different addresses. So bi-weekly governance proposals, small change. The, the process was that it read right. Like seven people kind of looked at it. And it's like, there aren't enough security audit firms in the world to like, you're either you're gonna have them on retainer, which is actually what Comp is doing now, so that they don't, that's like the solution, or you're, you're just gonna like, you know, check it and make sure. Now it's even worse than that, because when you're, you have a protocol, you have a bunch of smart contracts, um, and you're adding one or, or several, and you wanna be able to test things end to end, it's actually really hard to do it like like on a fork. You need to have a lot of like internal infrastructure and set up in order to do it accurately. So people don't really do it. They hope for the best. Um, I don't know if they expect the worst, but it, it's interesting and, and it's something that like I think we're gonna need like more transparency and standards like around protocols and how we're kind of people don't really know, so there needs to be more transparency around it. Upgradable contracts are terrible things, right? Like I'm gonna, like I'm just gonna say that because it's like I'm just going to be that human who has to be a little contrarian and say that, like, or maybe not contrarian. And we make the joke that the Uniswap gang tests in public, but they test in public because they don't upgrade the part contracts and the contracts don't get rug pulled. You see, like that's a feature, not a bug. Yep. Now that takes some serious, like coding stones to get out there and go like, I'm just going to push this into production and just hope it all works out. But that's the bet we're making. And I mean, I think it's a really an important one for us to say that like, you know, when you in traditional finance, if you go out there and make a bad deal, you get wrecked. That's just what happens. And so that's no different than what we're doing right now. We're just making it faster, and, uh, including everyone else. 
Um, from a technical perspective, uh, I like living in a world where like, hey, this address equals this amount, like this byte code. And that feels like more grounded and reasonable to me. Uh, over time, we migrate where that money goes to. Oh my goodness, money's locked up, stuff is happening. There might be ways to sort that out, but at least in the in the short run, I think it's really important, you know, anyhow. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up with a, uh, a quick fire little idea here. So um, really wanna provide value with this, with this uh, conversation. Hopefully we've done that for the most part. Uh, what is one thing that either a developer or a user can do proactively to help themselves in this space. And I will start by easily saying one very ridiculously simple thing, which is just please, for the love of God, use a hardware wallet. Please do not have things just sitting around in your MetaMask Chrome, Chrome extension. Please use a Trezor or a Nano Ledger. You would be shocked by how many people that I work with and audit, not in my own company, but clients, uh, unfortunately we, we hear these things. So please, for the love of God, use a hardware wallet. Um, yeah, adding to that, you should use a hardware wallet, but if you don't yet and you still have MetaMask and you still want to keep doing stuff in the meantime, at least make sure that your MetaMask auto locks after like two, three minutes. There you go. There you go. Yes. <laughs> it's an easy one. Yeah. I second everything you guys said. Um, and for, for devs, I think slow is fast. Um, so you, you can put off the launch a few weeks if someone's pressuring you. Just make sure you don't get wrecked. And uh, yeah, like uh, work on tooling. It's important. Yeah, I would say on a user side, uh, you know, it's not too much. Uh, maybe try and learn a little bit of solidity or, you know, whatever you're acting with because, you know, that, that's great that everything's publicly verifiable and, you know, the ability to look at something before you interact with it um, to give you like an overview of what's happening could be really beneficial. And uh, while they're suggesting, you know, software wallets, I'm, I'm a person who believes in on-chain security. So, like, you know, you can Gnosis multi-sig safe this yourself as well. So, like, just throwing that out there, that's a really good option. Multiple keys to the crypto is really what you're looking for. Just, just, and and the nice, like, you know, anyway, the, yeah, like, I, I'm going to say get a Gnosis safe out there if you've got some serious bags. Okay. All right, awesome. Well, hopefully this was uh, somewhat value-add to everyone. So thank you so much for all your time. So yeah, cheers. Thanks for it.